Welcome to lecture number five. Today we're going to talk about nitrogen sources for crop production. And the, to start off with, I'd like to clarify what exactly does it mean uh, when we say uh, fertilizer versus crop nutrients. And, and basically they're, they're the same thing, although many people view them as two different products. And when we look at fertilizer, what fertilizer is essentially is a, uh, it's a large number of naturally created or synthetically made material that includes uh, crop nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and, and other nutrients that are essential for plant growth. And it's these nutrients that are spread on the soil in order to increase the soil's capacity to support plant growth. We break the fertilizers into two categories, inorganic and organic. The inorganic fertilizers are those that we think of as that are man-made that we produce uh, in crop production. The other would be the organic. Now, the organic that we're referring to here is not what we think of when we go to the grocery store and there's organic food. When we, th we say organic, at least when I use the word organic, it means uh, whatever material you're talking about is primarily made of carbon. And so when we think of organic fertilizers, we think of those as quote unquote natural fertilizers. And basically they're the manures, uh, or if you want to think of it, the municipal biosolids from the sewer treatment facilities. Also, uh, a source of organic nutrients would be that of plant material that's returned, that's actually grown and returned to the soil for breakdown. So when we think of nitrogen source sources, uh, both organic and inorganic, uh, they both supply the nitrogen required for crop growth. Now when we talk about the nitrogen sources, it's important for us to manage them correctly and properly, uh, both from a, an economic and an environmental point of view. If we manage the, to utilize the nutrient supplies such as nitrogen, then we can minimize the loss because there's less uh, available to be lost to the environment. We also uh, optimize uh, harvest yield as well as uh, reduce the economic impact on a farming operation. If we utilize the nutrient, uh, therefore we don't lose it, we can optimize the investment the farmer makes in making the fertilizer application. So when, I, when we talk about uh, nitrogen utilization, I always call it the mom effect. Uh, if, if we use it properly, we can minimize the environmental impact by optimizing harvest yield and improving uh, the economics of the farming enterprise. And finally, we can maximize input utilization at the same time. So minimize environmental impact, optimize harvest yield or farm profitability, and maximizing uh, the utilization of the nitrogen applied. Now, there are both organic and inorganic sources that we described, but basically here, uh, in the in the Midwest and for that matter for any area that's uh, in commercial corn production inorganic sources of nitrogen are primarily used. The first source of nitrogen I want to visit about is anhydrous ammonia. Now anhydrous ammonia is a it really it, it's a the reason it runs around in these big tanks that in uh, natural atmospheric conditions it's a, it exists as a gas. So what we have to do is we have to either pressurize it or cool it because anhydrous ammonia boils at minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So if, of course, if you have a cold day, minus 28 or, or lower, uh, then you can have anhydrous ammonia sitting in a glass on the table. Uh, I wouldn't do that. But uh, as the temperature rises, we have to compensate. So therefore we add pressure to keep it as a liquid. <laughs> About 16% of all nitrogen fertilizers in the U.S. is applied as anhydrous ammonia. And by the way, we're the only place in the world today that uses anhydrous ammonia as a primary nitrogen source for corn production. Everyone else doesn't have an infrastructure or the ability to deal with a pressurized dangerous gas to apply to a field. We're the only ones that have the infrastructure and the equipment to do that. 
82% nitrogen is what we have with anhydrous ammonia. The primary reason for using it, because it's when you make an application, you're, you're putting on nitrogen. You don't have a lot of other stuff that goes along with it, so you don't have to pay for the transportation or for material that really isn't nitrogen. And I've already talked about it boiling at minus 28 degrees, and it must be pressurized. Therefore, it's, it's dangerous to use. So you have to have a training, and you have to have good equipment, which we have both of here in East Central Illinois. And it's called anhydrous. So the other uh, property, other than it being very cold, if you get it on you, it can freeze your skin. It's anhydrous, meaning without water. Therefore, it has a high affinity for water. So not only does it give you a cold burn, but it removes the water at the same time. So it's very dangerous to operate without the proper protective equipment, especially with your eyes, which are primarily water. And since it is a pressurized uh, gas made a liquid, we have to inject it because when we inject it, the liquid, uh, once it escapes the, uh, the system, it turns into a gas, but when it's in the soil, the gas captures water and we don't lose it. So it's a good source of nitrogen as long as it's properly utilized. And the other reason anhydrous is, is popular in this area is because it's uh, the most economic source. It's frankly, the cheapest source of nitrogen. And the reason for that is anhydrous ammonia is the basic building block by which we build most of the other nitrogen fertilizers. So as you can see to the left, anhydrous ammonia, which is represented by NH3, is utilized uh, when combined with some other products to make the various different fertilizers. Now, some of those fertilizers, one is ammonium sulfate, You'll hear about it because it has not only nitrogen, ammonium, but it has sulfur, which is in the sulfate form. This product is available primarily because of a manufacturing process when making nylons. Uh, it's a byproduct, and then it's manufactured into a fertilizer, which is a great way of, of recycling uh, byproduct, and it's utilized in the industry. Ammonium sulfate is 21% nitrogen and 24% sulfur. So when we talked about anhydrous ammonia being 82% nitrogen, you can kind of get the understanding why anhydrous ammonia is utilized here in the Midwest because it's like four times, a little less than four times the amount of nitrogen per pound as this source. But the, the advantage of ammonium sulfate, it has sulfur with it as well. It provides both nutrients for crop production. Now with ammonium sulfate, it's not a pressurized gas, it's a solid. So you can throw it on the surface of the soil and hopefully uh, soon after application incorporate it. But uh, it can, it's a lot more versatility and safer to use. Now the thing is about ammonium sulfate, it has a little more nitrogen from the standpoint of each molecule. So it's a little more acidifying when it comes to the soil. Another source of nitrogen is nitrogen solutions. Now, when we talk about nitrogen solutions, we're talking about UAN. That's urea ammonium nitrate. Now, of the nitrogen solutions, about 44% of the total nitrogen consumed in the U.S. is, is UAN solutions. 28% nitrogen, 32% nitrogen, and in basically half of it is urea and half it is in ammonium nitrate form. Although they're liquids, that's the composition of the two. Now, 28% versus 32, the difference or where, you, where they're utilized is all depends upon how they're stored. If they're stored outside over the winter when the temperatures are cold, they're usually stored as 28% solution. If they're coming uh, down the river in a barge or it's not real cold or if it's in a really large tank that can't cool over the winter, then they're stored at 32%. And the difference is the salting out temperature, meaning the temperature at which it gets so cold, the nitrogen starts to fall out of solution. Now, UAN solutions are easier and safer to handle than anhydrous ammonia. And uh, they're applied as a, uh, a not under pressure. There, there really is a pump that they're, they're forced under pressure out of the applicator but they're a little more uniform in their application. And the advantage of the UAN solutions, instead of water, the UAN can be used to carry the herbicides, which controls the weeds in the farmer's fields. And it kind of makes a combination application. So I could put on his nitrogen as well as put on his herbicides in one pass. 
Now, when we're using UAN solutions, although we can put it on the surface, uh, there's, there's no issue with that. Because it contains a product called urea, we need uh, or we should incorporate it soon after application. Urea. Urea is the world's most common source of nitrogen fertilizer. When we talk about urea, uh, it's commonly used because of its simplicity. It's, it's not dangerous to handle. It's the most concentrated form of dry nitrogen fertilizer, 46% nitrogen. And uh, that's why it's convenient to use around the world. However, urea is a form of nitrogen that it needs to be incorporated within 24 to 48 hours after application to minimize the potential for loss. The loss is due to something we call volatilization. And those of you who have done assignment number three know all about volatilization. If you haven't done assignment number three, I'll try to make sure that we give you the opportunity to do that. But it, uh, if we put urea on the surface, it can turn into a gas and we can lose the uh, significant amount of the nitrogen up to 40% can be lost if left on the surface for five to 10 days. Now, if we put the urea on the surface, we can delay that response for about two weeks, waiting for a rain to incorporate it. And if we use something called a volatilization inhibitor, in some cases we call them urease inhibitors. And this inhibitor, this volatilization inhibitor, allows us to put urea or urea-containing fertilizers on the soil surface and wait for a couple of weeks, hoping that we get a half inch of rain or more to serve as an incorporation or mechanically incorporate it with a tillage pass. Nitrogen stabilizers. When we talk about nitrogen stabilizers, there are two categories within nitrogen stabilizers. Some people also call these nitrogen enhancements. The first category I wanted to, to bring up is nitrification inhibitors. These, these products inhibit or slow the process of nitrification, which is the conversion of ammonium nitrogen to nitrate nitrogen. And the reason we want to slow that process when nitrogen is in the ammonium form, that's a form that, that's really stable. The microbes can't do anything to it. It really tries to hold on to the soil. So it's a good form we want. We call it stable nitrogen. Once we go through the conversion of ammonium to nitrate, nitrate's got oxygen. The, the microbes can swipe the oxygen and turn it into a gas. We refer to that as denitrification. Or uh, when it's nitrate, it doesn't really hold on to the soil, so it can move with soil water, and we call that loss leaching. So nitrification inhibitors are important, especially when farmers are applying their nitrogen well in advance of when the plant's going to utilize it. The other category of inhibitors, or I should say stabilizers, enhancements, would be the volatilization inhibitors. And that's the one I just recently talked about with, used with urea, because a volatilization inhibitor allows that nitrogen, uh, urea nitrogen, to stay as urea nitrogen for an extended period of time. And that allows for a rain event or mechanical incorporation to get it incorporated in the soil so we minimize uh, any loss that could occur. And it usually a volatilization inhibitor gives us at least 10 to 14 days, if not more. And many times in the spring of the year, we anticipate a rain uh, before that period. Hopefully in the spring, we get a rain within two weeks or we have another problem. So some of the nitrogen stabilizers, uh, the uh, would be uh, NSERV, Instinct. These are both called nitropyrin. They inhibit nitrification. These are the most common in nitrification inhibitors. Now, the most common volatilization inhibitor is Agritane. That's a trade name. A common name is NBPT. And uh, this past year, there's been uh, many products released in the marketplace that are generic. Uh, agritane uh, containing MBPT. But agritane is probably the one that you hear the most about and it's been around in the marketplace for the longest time. And again, NSERV and Instinct, both by Dow AgriSciences, are the most common and most well accepted nitrification inhibitors. Now, there are some other nitrogen products that um, are utilized in a limited basis that are control or slow release. In other words, when you put them on, they don't all. Uh, all the product doesn't become available right away, which helps minimize the potential for nitrogen loss. 
And these products are ref referred to as SRF, or slow release fertilizers. Uh, they reduce the rate of nitrogen released into the soil compared to other conventional nitrogen products such as urea. By slowing this process, uh, they try to release the nitrogen as the crop needs it. Now, I don't think these uh, totally match up, but it's kind of a great concept. It's a good concept to consider, and it helps minimize the loss of nitrogen throughout the year. The Probably the only product in the marketplace that I'm aware of that I consider a slow-release uh, slow product or a controlled-released uh, nitrogen product is ESN by Agrium. Uh, it's a polymer, it has a little thin plastic coating on it that slowly releases the urea out of the coating uh, as we get into the spring of the year and the soils warm up. There are some other nitrogen sources we can call organic, of course. These are mainly manures. Uh, the nitrogen in the manure can be considered stable or unstable depending on the form. If it's ammonium or if it's bound into the carbon material, then it's stable. If it's in a nitrate form, it's considered unstable. Now the animal-based manures or, or materials contain a, a, a maybe in some cases a high content of nitrogen and some others maybe not so much depending on the age but normally we think of as the uh, animal based manures con containing a lot of nitrogen and when we talk about that we've talked about this earlier this carbon to nitrogen ratio that means the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the manures is relatively low so there's a high mineralization possibility most plant-based materials have low nitrogen content, provides very little mineralization. So when we work the green manures into the soil, we keep in mind that there's not a lot of nitrogen returned that way, so we're not expecting a lot to be released, such as when we get with manures. An exception to that would be some of the legume plants, such as alfalfa. Alfalfa is a wonderful liberator of nitrogen. It's a, as it breaks down, it mineralizes, releasing nitrogen into the soil. But there's not too many farmers that grow alfalfa without harvesting it and turn it back to the soil for release of nitrogen. It used to be a long time ago, but not now. Now, uh, when we talk about the organic nitrogen sources, how do we figure out what's going to be uh, liberated and what's not? We analyze the material to determine its carbon to nitrogen ratio. We, do, we analyze the material for the amount of carbon and we analyze it for the amount of nitrogen and therefore we can come up with a carbon to nitrogen ratio. And now finally, of these nitrogen sources, how much do we really need to apply? And the best way to figure that out is if you want to go to the website, Google, I, I do this all the time, just Google N-Rate. And when you Google the N-Rate, normally the first hit you come to is called the N-Rate calculator. If not, you can use the hyperlink that I have here. And although it's an Iowa State hyperlink, it is for all the states highlighted on the map in the, in the Midwest from the standpoint of how to determine the amount of nitrogen to apply. And this rate that, that is calculated is based upon nitrogen rate studies that we've done over the past 10 years and it uh, really works well it's uh, we're constantly trying to make it better but again uh, this is probably our most recent attempt and it's called the nitrogen rate calculator and I just hit the wrong place there close whoops excuse me <laughs> I made a, the hyper jump to the website. Okay, there we go. So you've completed lesson number five. Uh, you can visit the uh, website, newtracker.com, to finish uh, the assignment number five, take the quiz, and move on. If you have any questions, send me an email or ask, ask your teacher, and I'll be glad to visit with you and address the questions as they come up. If you get a chance, make sure you check out the additional reading material. Hopefully, you've had a little uh, opportunity to check out some of these sources. I think you'll find them enjoyable. Thanks for listening.